welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer sessions, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I will turn the meeting over to Mr. Leland Milstein. Sir, you may begin. Thanks very much. And thanks, everyone, for uh, listening in today on our Thursday webcast series. The Thursday webcast series is a bi-monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two model organizations, methods, materials. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from a slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. This session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE Category 1. If you haven't already given me your certification number, please email me after the session. Also, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which ACT can provide to anyone who needs one. So again, email me after the session. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees. Please consider joining if you are not already a member. I want to say a big thank you today to our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Today's session is Species Selection Part 3, Right Tree, Right Place. Planting and caring for the right tree in the right place is critical to optimizing benefits, reducing threats from invasive plant species, and minimizing conflicts with other aspects of the urban infrastructure. The right tree, right place viewpoint emphasizes matching the best tree species to the unique dimensions and circumstances of each planting site. Planting with these considerations in mind will help ensure that trees remain healthy, grow appropriately, increase property value, reduce energy bills, and won't require extensive trimming or removal to prevent interference with power lines or pipes. When done right, trees will grow in value and pay you back year after year. Our first speaker today is Greg Page, Arboretum Curator at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratory Arboretum in Charlotte, North Carolina. Greg joined Bartlett Ranks as Arboretum Curator in May of 2005. Greg's career in public horticulture has spanned 20 years. Previous to Bartlett, he was at Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Belmont, North Carolina, and at the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. Additionally, he has worked at the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, the Holden Arboretum outside Cleveland, Ohio, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, as well as tour of duties uh, in the landscape maintenance world, the nursery trade, and even a stint as a horticulturist at the cemetery. Thanks for being with us yet again today, Greg. It's good to be here. Take it away. All right. Uh, again, uh, very happy to do this stuff for Alliance for Community Trees. As Leland mentioned, if you're if you're not a member, um, I strongly encourage that and endorse that. Um, and follow us through on those types of things. It's a great group, and very happy to be here. Um, this is part three of, of species selection, and what we're going to talk about today is, is getting the right plant in the right place in your, your landscapes. And um, without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. Um, there's my information on the screen there and also a website to Bartlett. If you are curious about what Bartlett does or, or want some more information concerning what we do, just uh, follow through on that, on that link. This um, first slide that I'm showing is this is the, the money shot for the, the whole presentation and uh, some really good information. And once the uh, the webinar is over uh, down the, the road, they'll be able to you'll be able to access this and and uh, and watch it again and and have uh, the slide to, to use. It's a great uh, breakdown of plant selection considerations and um, really really helpful in in, in picking the, the correct plant for the for the correct site. And one of the first things you want to think about when you're looking for plants in, in your landscapes, um, the very first thing I would say is, is design needs of your project. What do you want that plant to do? What do you want it to accomplish in the landscape? Uh, do you want it to direct traffic? Do you want it to steer people in a certain direction? Um, when I mention traffic, I, I talk about vehicular and also the flow of, of people moving. This is a big concern on in parks, college campuses, street trees, you know, any any type of landscape, gardens, whatever you're, you're thinking of. Do you want plants to screen a view, or you want to block the view of a utility, of a building, 
of, of a view that's not as pleasant, very important factor, and, and lots of different types of plants that you can choose for those types of things. Do you want to frame a vista? Do you want to direct the eye in a landscape to a certain direction? Do you want to highlight a hardscape feature in a landscape? Um, and that's what I'm talking about when I mention framing a vista. You can also define shapes and views with plants based on the shape of the uh, of the type of plant that you're putting in the landscape, and I'll, I'll talk about that next. And modifying microclimates. Do you want to control uh, glare protection, light and, and sheen off of a, of a window on buildings? Is, is a concern in landscapes. You can use plants to control that. Air filtration is important. Uh, plants are great at slowing down exhaust from plants and helping keep the air clean. They provide shade to many situations, uh, street trees, parking lots, any type of, of landscape. Shade is an important consideration in a tree. And controlling sound. If you want to block sound from a busy neighborhood, from a school, from a park, plants can also offer those types of things and, and helping with the design needs of a project. And runoff reduction, this is a very popular avenue of, of plants right now in controlling stormwater runoff, uh, green roofs. It, it's an important factor in, in the design needs of a, of a plant. And I mentioned uh, shapes, sizes of, of plants. The, the next topic is design traits of plants. What types of things are you looking for when you're selecting a plant? How tall is the plant going to be? Is it going to be round? Is it going to be narrow? All these things depend on where they're going to go in the landscape. What colors are you looking for? Do you want fall color? Do you want all season color? And also think about what textures you want in, in a plant when you're selecting for a landscape. Do you want a fine texture? Do you want a coarse texture? All things to consider. Growth rate is very important. How quickly is the plant going to establish in the landscape? How wide is it going to get? How tall is it going to get? And, and those are factors that are going to be restrictive in, in a design and in landscapes. Do you want the plant to be deciduous or evergreen? Do you want it to keep its leaves year-round, or is, or is that an issue? And sometimes a, a maintenance concern will come into play when you're thinking about deciduous plants, and I'll talk about that in, in a little while. And finally, the, the physical environment of the site. What are the site considerations? What climate zone are you in? Well, what can you get away with from a zonal perspective in a plant? And on that same tangent, what microclimates will be created on your property? A lot of times, just the slightest degree of elevation can turn the, the climate zone of a plant area either up or down. Um, soil factors, very, very important and probably the most important factor in establishing plants and selecting types of plants. And I'll talk about that in a little greater detail. Precipitation or irrigation, how are these plants going to be watered and, and cared for? Is, is an irrigation system going to be in place? Is it on a site that you just can't put in an irrigation system and it's going to rely solely on what Mother Nature can provide for it? And sunlight is very important. When you're selecting plants, some plants can take shade, some can take sun, and uh, I mentioned glare and microclimates. Um, in, a, in an enclosed area, the sun can wreak havoc on landscapes and really amp up temperatures. The, the beating rays of sun coming off of hardscapes, coming off of buildings, can raise the temperature in a, in a site, and that's what I talk about when I'm mentioning uh, some of the aspects of microclimates. What are the structural limitations of your site when you're, you're considering a site and considering plants for a landscape? Are there utilities in the ground? Are there utilities above ground? Is there a foundation of the building? Those are very important things to consider. And existing species assessment on the site. What kind of plants are on the property? Are they doing well? Are they doing poorly? And uh, are they are they native? Are they invasive? All things to consider. Um, so this, this is a very important slide, and it sends the, the framework for, for what I'm going to talk about through the rest of the presentation. And it will be good to refer back to it. I mentioned maintenance requirements in a, in a planting. Um, how much work is going to be done to contain those plants, and are you going to have those facilities, those 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 things at your disposal to take care of plants? Uh, pruning, raking up leaves, spent flowers, spent seed pods—all things to think about when you're when you're selecting a plant. And it's going to depend on traffic flow and and what the use of that landscape is going to be. So the first slide I just showed uh, shows pruning these these pleached arches that are in the center of the photograph. Um, all things to consider when, when lying out your plants.
And I mentioned framing a vista, um, the picture on the right, the archway going through into a garden area, the tree that was planted at the very end was planted there to, to, to line up with the middle of that archway. Um, and another design characteristic of that plant is it's narrow. That's a very small spot, so you can't have a big, wide-growing plant that's going to overgrow the, the walkway and, and allow you not to, to pass without the plant being in the way. Um, from a maintenance standpoint, you've got to think about the leaves. If leaves are dropping on those sidewalks all the time, you're going to have to take care of that. And, and this picture, the plant is, a, is an evergreen magnolia that keeps its leaves. The picture on the left, uh, the, the, the nice vestigial oak tree, that's kind of framing that edge of that building and, and knocking off that harsh edge and, and adding some nice green color and texture. And at the same point, that's a pretty small spot for a, a tree to mature and, and reach a good size. So a fastidia tree was used both to take up that, that vertical nature and to grow in a, in, a limited, in a limited space. Designed traits and things to consider when you're selecting plants for your landscape. Um, another avenue, uh, deciduous, evergreen plants, it's good to mix those things together so you've got some good textures, some good contrast, and, and, and I've mentioned in other things that I've talked about, having multiple seasons of interest, but this particular spot needs some, something bright to kind of lighten up this, this dark corner of this building. Um, again, that, uh, that tall vertical nature of those evergreen trees kind of takes the harshness off of that vertical nature and the hardness of the edges of the building. And this low-growing shrub, it's an abelia, um, very bright and really lightened up that corner of a, of a pretty drab part of the, this, this particular landscape. So just some examples of, of how plants can affect that. Um, I, I mentioned site assessments and uh, wanted to talk about those in a, in a little more detail. Um, hardiness zones and microclimates, I talked about those. And... You know, all of us live in zonal areas where we can grow certain types of plants, so it's important to, to stick to those. But when you've got a courtyard or when you're planting closer to buildings, um, you'll have some microclimate. The temperatures will be warmer than they usually are. Uh, there's going to be, you know, you've got to think about exposures. Are things going to be open? Frost pockets, if you've got low spots, you're more likely to have some frost. And I mentioned reflective heat coming off of walkways, roadways, coming off the buildings, all things to consider how that's going to affect the temperature and the hardiness of the plants that you're losing. Limitations to um, above ground growth. A lot of times we're looking down at the ground when we're putting plants in and thinking about plants, but think about the, the limitations of, of things above and where the plants are going to grow. And I'm talking about power lines, edges of buildings, overhangs, all important things to think about. And the sunlight of the site, very important. If you've got big mature trees that are hanging over, you know, it's important to visit a site at all hours of the day to kind of get a sense of what it's going to look like and, and what types of plants and the requirements of those plants are going to be for that site. Soil factors in big, bold letters there, very important. All things hinge on that, the success of your plants. And I mentioned existing species assessment. It's very important to, to visit your site. If you're starting from scratch, not much of an issue, but if you've got some existing plants, uh, look at the health of those. That will help you determine what other types of plants that you can use and, and how well the soil is and how those plants are working. Invasive species, uh, it's a hot topic these days, as it should be. And if you've got invasive species on uh, an existing site, think about how to control those and ultimately possibly to remove those. And here are some shots of some existing sites. You know, look for things like the picture on the left. Here's a row of maples along the edge of a building, and, and one is, is died. You know, what caused that? Is it, a, is it a cultural thing? Is it something in the soil? Is it just a poor quality tree? You know, there's, there's some things going on in this existing site, and, it, it, you know, you need to know what's going on with that. The upper picture, the nice red clay of North Carolina, um, here's the site that's going in. They put in some utility lines, some drains fiber optic, all those types of things, then they're going to come back in and, and douse a little top layer of topsoil and expect you to plant in that. So it, it's good to know what's going on under the ground before you start to put plants in and, and what types of things you're going to be working with. And the below picture, this is the courtyard at a college campus. Um, not a lot of protection of the existing trees, which I'll talk about in very small detail in a minute, but we're going to have to come back in these sites and, and, and put in plants. So it's important to know what's going on and what has gone on during that, that entire process. And there's lots of resources out there. 
This is one from Cornell University, recommended urban trees, site assessment, and tree selection for stress tolerance. It's a great resource, and I believe if you go to that website that's on the, the slide, you can download it for free, um, or you can order a hard copy. And I think it might have been 10 or $12, but it's a great resource full of really good information out of Cornell University. And here's a book that I reference a lot, and I may have mentioned it in some other webinars, and I know I mentioned it in a lot of lectures that I do, Planting Trees, uh, Gary Watson's book, uh, excellent resource for anything to do with, with planting and, and sites down to giving you a list in the back of the book so some things that, that work well and, and don't work well. And again, there's a link down below through the ISA where you can order this book, an excellent resource. So here's what we're working with a lot of times. Here's here's the, the what we're expected to grow good plants into, or or a situation like this. Um, this is a, a piece of property behind our arboretum. They cleared it and are going to put in single family homes. If you look at the picture on the left, at the top of that pipe, that's the well head, uh, wellhead, and that was the original grade of the property. So they've removed all that soil. And now we're going to, have to come back into that site and, and plant trees and, and things for a, a happy landscape. So things to think about when evaluating a site. Soil is probably the most important factor in establishing plants, selecting plants. Um, you know, all these factors are come into play in how well these plants are going to are going to, are going to do. And the way to find this out is, is as simple as taking a soil test. And the things that you want to look for are the nutrient levels of the soil, the pH, the organic matter, the cation exchange capacity, which helps that that soils interact with nutrients so the plants can take those up. What, what's the texture of the soil? It's very important to determine its, its drainage, um, its compaction, how much organic matter will be needed for it, and ultimately the, the volume of that soil to support certain sizes of plants. And here's a simple soil test. We do these all the time. Um, and very important to, to get this type of information. Most extension services in the states you live in can will do this for a very small fee, but everything starts at this point. So it's important to uh, do something as simple as taking a, a soil test to, to see what nutrients you have, what you need to, to get that soil into a happy medium to grow, uh, grow plants. Very important first step in that investment of planting. I mentioned construction uh, on a site, protecting existing trees, very important that those steps are taken, and a lot of times they're not. Uh, this is kind of a worst-case scenario. Good intentions to begin with, but they ended up using that site because it was protected to store uh, equipment, tools, and, and a lay-down site for, for mixing mortar. Important to visit sites to ensure that that doesn't happen. And ultimately, that's going to affect the health of, of not only the existing plant material, but anything else that you might work into that site. Important to stay on top of that. And I think I may have shown this before. This is a, just a basic picture of an existing mature, mature tree. And minimally, how far out to the drip line of that tree is where we recommend people protect those and keep that free of any kind of compaction or lay down or storing of equipment or, or disturbing of that, that root area to keep that tree happy and healthy in that existing site. So this is what we're, we're given to make nice, happy medium for plants. So how do we get, you know, hopefully some of the things I talked about will help you take a site like this and turn it into to this. Um, not an easy thing to do and important to follow some of those steps to, to get that where you want to want to get it. And just a final uh, a note on, on, on preparing your, your planting site. Uh, I can't emphasize enough to always test the soil for, for pH and, and nutrients before you plant. Um, if you have to do any in, in improvements to that soil, they should be con connected tree to tree, not just in the area where a tree is going to go. And uh, think about the dimensions and the guidelines for the, the urban soil. And those resources that I mentioned highlight those in, a, in, in more detail. And just some examples of some poor decisions on, on placing a plant in a wrong location. Um, this is a, in my hometown, uh, a, a big shrub that's gotten too big. It was actually touching the foundation of this house and caused the, you know, they ultimately ended up removing this plant because it caused those support beams to rot. But, you know, think about how big a plant's going to be before you put it in the ground and, and 
if it's going to meet any kind of maintenance requirements. Another similar situation, uh, they had good intentions when the tree was very small. This is in California, it's a date palm. It was actually touching the foundation of this house, and you can see by the shot that it's pulled the irrigation out of the uh, out of the ground as it's growing against the foundation of the house. Um, you know, think long term and down the road as to how the ultimate size of that plant is going to affect the landscape around it, and ultimately the the, the foundation of the structure of, of this house is affected by that poor decision. We see this a lot in our neck of the woods in, in development. Um, they always call for trees to go in from a zoning perspective, and they put them in before the project is done. Um, I'm sure the installer had good intentions, but he put this tree exactly where the flag was or the X on the ground. And you know, with a little bit of thought or forethought, they could have moved this tree in either direction a couple feet and wouldn't have run into the situation. But ultimately, after a, a pretty big rainstorm, this tree was completely washed out of the ground. So. You know, think about your site and where things need to be and, and adjust them appropriately so you're not wasting your time with the, you know, with the investment of the cost of that plant, the cost of somebody to plant it, mulch it, stake it, get it established, and then ultimately to come back behind and have to replace it with all of that, those resources again. see this a lot in all urban situations. It's, it's great to take advantage of that space under a power line. Um, this is a, a, a carpinus, uh, a, a musclewood, a great urban tree, but ultimately this one's going to grow right up into those power lines, and they actually were touching the, the bottom foam line after they planted these. Good intentions, not the right plant for the right spot. There's lots of other choices they could have used to take advantage of that space um, and, and had a tree in a, in, a, in a very valuable space, but ultimately they're either going to have to come back and do some pretty drastic pruning or eventually remove these trees. Um, the shot on the left is a, a cultural concern. Um, the, the dreaded mulch volcanoes over mulching of plants that also cause some stress. But the take home message is, is species selection. Pick a plant that's not going to ultimately grow into those power lines and, and save yourself the cost of the time and the investment of planting that plant. Another home landscape where uh, uh, good intentions, probably a Christmas tree planted outside the front door and didn't think about how ultimately big the tree was going to get. And this plant actually was touching. Uh, you could stick your hand out the front door and, and touch the branches of this of this tree, um, not thinking about the ultimate height of a plant when you're, you're putting it in a, in a site. And the, and the take-home message, uh, the final thing, is, is selecting the right plant for the right spot, seeing long-term and, and, and down the road. How big is the plant going to get ultimately? Is it going to be the right thing for the space? Uh, make sure you've got good soil. Think about all those types of things for you to protect the investment and the, and the time and the energy and, and get that, that plant started off on the right foot. Think about all the, the things that, that I, I blew through here and, and that we're going to talk about again today. And that's it in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, and I think we'll open up for questions. That's great. Thanks so much, Greg. Mm -hmm. Pat, can you open up the line for questions? Certainly. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please unmute your phone and record your name when prompted. To withdraw your request, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment, please. Great. And while we're uh, waiting for that to get queued up, I want to remind folks that you can also ask questions online. If you don't want to talk over the phone, you can uh, click that Q&A tab at the top of your screen and type in questions, and I'll just read them out. So that's an option as well. Greg, thanks for uh, a really, actually, very comprehensive, I thought, overview of, of lots of the different considerations. Um, I especially really liked the prescription for assessing the site and all the different uh, considerations that people will want to keep in mind and uh, and take account of before selecting the tree. Um, is there sort of a, I guess you, you gave it to us, but is, is that a checklist that you sort of take with you every time you go to a new site, or do you think it's something, it's something you have developed that you just keep in your head? Uh, how do you how do you manage all this great information? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it is, it would be a good checklist to have on hand when you're, you're going to a site to establish, uh, planting and, and thinking down those, down those terms. 
Um, it, it's something that over the years that you know, folks here at the lab have talked about, and I've just kind of pulled it together as I've done lectures. And it, it, it's a great kind of first step to kind of to, to think about how much space is, it is the plant ultimately going to need. What, what, how can I get the most use out of this plant? You know, don't just think don't just think about planting something green and walking away from it. And what, a lot of us do, and I'm as guilty of that as anybody. But it, it's a good checklist for lots of different people to use. You know, site managers, landscape architects, arborists. Um, you know, and just the general homeowner. And uh, it, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It, it's not too hard to kind of digest. It, it, it makes it makes pretty good sense, and uh, it, it's worked well on on many um, many conversations and many many factories to kind of you know it, it takes so much time to plant a, to plant a plant. Right. Never mind the cost of it. And if you if you don't think about those types of things. You know, the, the one picture that I showed of that, that palm tree, it doesn't do it justice. I mean, it was cracking the foundation of that house. You know, if they had planted that thing another four feet away from the house, they wouldn't have those issues. So now they're, they're dealing with fixing uh, a pretty serious problem with your, your home and paying somebody a pretty significant amount of money to remove a pretty good-sized plant that ultimately needs to be removed. So something as simple as when they planted that five, seven years ago is putting it, you know, realizing how big it's going to get, planting it a little bit further away, and thinking long-term how that plant's going to be um, could have avoided all of those all those financial and uh, emotional headaches. And I think I'd, I'd say that I was, a lot of uh, nonprofits and urban city, urban forestry uh, programs and departments are doing a great job recently in the last few years getting the word out about uh, selecting the right location and planting in the right place. And a absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think that Chip is going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, I wanted to follow up about uh, all the different kinds of sort of great infrastructure that you you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, power lines to the the water downspout, uh, irrigation pipes, sidewalks, uh, and I think for the most part we were looking at things we were installing uh, trees around some of that that was already in place, but in some of the construction uh, photos you showed that some new infrastructure was being uh, put in in places where trees and other green infrastructure already existed. Right. I was wondering if maybe you could give a quick uh, kind of sort of assessment or response about when to preserve green infrastructure and actually relocate the gray infrastructure around it. Right, and, and that's a situation that, that we all deal with um, when we're, you know, we've got existing landscapes and they come in and put in, for example, a fiber optic line or a cable line or, or whatever, um, and you've got existing plants, how do you deal with that? Um, if it's a mature tree, there's there's steps that you need to take, and you know as minimal damage that you can do to that plant's root system to install that. Um, we've got a tool called an air spade that we use. That's great for that sort of thing. It's better than a, a mechanical trencher that's going to physically cut roots. So try to be more sensitive to the, the bigger, harder to replace plants. And if you can if you can work around those instead of going through them, do that. If you've got smaller plants that you can actually lift out of the ground until that type of work is done. And I've done those sorts of things before. Um, pop things out of the ground, protect them until the job is done, and then put them back. Or if you just have to bite the bullet and remove some smaller plants, those are those are the, the options that you you might have to deal with. And depending on the type of service, depending on what you're you're installing, those are just some of the things that you have to deal with. But you know, I would I would say that the more Emotionally, um, you are attached. The, the the harder it is going to be to replace a, a bigger plant. Try to work those utilities and those types of things around those types of plants, if at all possible. And if you actually, if you have to to do something, use the least inv invasive method to put those those systems in. And uh, for bigger, mature trees, you know, in a perfect world, protecting that entire root zone is what you need to do. But in some cases, you, you have to work through those and use the least invasive method to do that, to, to not cause stress and damage to those those, uh, those big investments of a, a bigger, mature plant. 
Hey, Greg, this is Chip. If I might add in, uh, one of the things to do if you're planning a large-scale project which is going to involve utilities is to try and get a hold of the, the affected utilities early on in the process. Right. Uh, to see if there may be some some way to work around that with utilities. Don't don't wait until your drawings are final and everything's ready to go before you contact utilities. Uh, I would highly recommend pulling them in early um, so you get an expectation of what can be done. That that's a That's a great point, and it's... You know, communication is, is a beautiful thing, and starting starting from the get-go with those types of things, um, you know, we recently put a new building here on the property, and that's the first thing that we did. We talked to the power companies. We talked to the gas companies. Where are these things going to go? And then we came in and, and worked around those types of things. Um, it's so much easier to, to open up those dialogues and develop those relationships and do those types of things. Um, you know, why go through those those headaches if you've got people that are capable and uh, willing to help you with those types of things and avoid those headaches to begin with? So that's a great point. And I think it's probably a great transition into the next part of our webcast. Unless, do we have any, Pat, do we have any questions in queue? No, sir, we do not. All right, well, thanks very much, Greg. Thank you. Next up, uh, you just heard him for a minute there, is Chip Brown, who is Forestry Manager for Allegheny Power, working out of Jeanette, Pennsylvania, just east of Pittsburgh. Chip has responsibility for managing the vegetation management program in the western half of Allegheny Power System, covering much of their area in West Virginia and about half of southwest Pennsylvania. He's been with Allegheny Power for 24 years and in his current position for the past 10 years. Thanks very much for being with us today, Chip. Okay, thanks, Leland. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody and and sort of bring a, a little bit of utility perspective to this topic. It's uh, it's something that utilities have worked with for for quite a while. And as you can see on the the slide there, the, the opening slide, it's we're talking about right tree, right place programs. But one of the things that we accomplish through right tree, right place programs is is we reduce the community conflict that is often created between utilities and communities when it comes time to perform our maintenance. Uh, to protect uh, the power lines from trees. I'd kind of like to cover today uh, three or four different things. Number one, just what is a utility forester and what does a utility forester do and why do we do what we do? Uh, what is right tree, right place from the utility perspective? And, and I have some examples of some replacement programs, uh, both on an individual tree basis and on a community-wide basis that, that maybe can serve as models uh, for other people. A little bit about Allegheny Power to start. We we do serve in four states, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, we have about 1.5 million customers, which you know that sounds like a, a lot of customers for the size area we cover. It's a relatively rural uh, area that is uh, has a lot of small communities. Now, we have about 60,000 miles of overhead power lines, and we have an annual vegetation budget of about $34 million. Uh, the vegetation budgets for utilities across the country is somewhere in the two to three billion dollar range, and so it's a very expensive program for utilities to undertake uh, across the country. Our forestry group is made up of 29 people, and 25 of those 29 are certified arborists through the ISA. Um, why do we do what we do? Uh, the basic answer is we manage vegetation to prevent or reduce the occurrence of vegetation-related power interruptions. And power interruptions take two different forms. You can have the power interruption that your lights go out and they might stay out for an hour or two hours, in some severe cases maybe a day or two. And uh, sometimes those are from trees, but sometimes from other causes. But our, uh, our job as utility foresters is to try and make sure it's not trees that are creating those interruptions. The other type of interruption that you may, may see at your house or your business is what we know is a momentary interruption, at least at our company. It's where the lights might flash off and then come back on after a second or two delay. Maybe they do that a second time. And that's, that's related to protective devices that are on the system. Uh, if a system detects a fault, it will automatically take the power out. And then uh, after a period of a minute, a second or two, it will automatically put the power back onto the line. And if the fault is clear, then your power stays on. And if you've ever seen a situation where the power blinks on and off two or three times, usually if it blinks off the third time, it's going to stay off and you're going to have a sustained outage. And so we try also to manage the vegetation to keep those faults from occurring uh, if they're momentary in nature. 
We also plan, schedule, and oversee an army of tree crews, and this can vary by utility. In some utilities, those are in-house crews. Uh, mostly, it's a contract uh, crew industry. And, uh, for example, on our system, any, on any given day, we might have between five and 600 uh, tree contract personnel uh, performing vegetation maintenance on our system. And then anything that we can do to improve the program efficiency or productivity is also part of our mission is related to vegetation, and uh, that would include uh, working right tree, right place programs with different communities. Okay, most utility foresters work in two different environments. Uh, we have what we call the rural right-of-way, which is primarily that right-of-way where it runs through the woods. And here it's more of an ecosystem management where we try and keep trees out of the lines and also maintain the floors in what we call, what we call early successional states in order to keep uh, trees out that would eventually grow into the line and possibly create a problem. And also then if we can keep the floors in a, a forb or grass stage, if there is an outage in that particular stretch of right away, then it speeds up the restoration process uh, because it's more accessible for the linemen to come back in, locate, and fix a problem. And then we also have the residential and town environments we work in, and, and that's more of an individual tree management at that point where we're, we're working from tree to tree, possibly down a street or in people's yards. And this individual tree management is where the right tree, right place concept is really practiced by utilities. Here's a couple of pictures that show you sort of a rural environment on our system. Uh, the picture on the left is a, is a wooded area in, in, uh, out near Parkersburg, West Virginia. Uh, you can see that we're maintaining the trees on the edge of the right-of-way to keep them from growing into the conductor, as well as trying to keep the floor in, in a grassy stage. Uh, so if there is a tree or other issue that happens in that stretch of right-of-way, uh, it can be located and power can be restored relatively quickly. Uh, the picture on the right shows uh, another stretch of right-of-way also outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, where we've worked through there and actually we've applied herbicides to that stretch and we've had a nice recolonization by some wildflowers in that area. Then we have our, our more of our town environments and here we have a couple pictures of uh, some town tree environments. The picture on the left is, is actually uh, Valley Avenue in Winchester, Virginia. A lot of exotic elms have been planted in Winchester over the years and uh, you can see the power poles kind of slipping down the lane on the left hand side there of the street. And uh, so this obviously is a, is a very time-consuming and expensive process for utilities uh, to try and maintain those, those lines and those trees to keep that vegetation out of the conductor. And on the right-hand side is a picture from a uh, small town in West Virginia, Buchanan, West Virginia. Uh, once again, you have that lawn strip between the sidewalk and the street, um, but we do have mature trees that have been planted there, large growing species uh, that we've had to maintain in order to keep them out of the power line. So why do we do what we do? Um, we maintain, we want to maintain the continuity of service to our customers. And so we want to keep those trees out of the lines. We also want to clear the floor in the right way so restoration could be accomplished faster. We want to avoid issues with regulatory commissions as well. Many states today have established targets for reliability for utilities. And uh, so it's our goal to make sure that we are meeting those, those reliability targets as established by the various states uh, so that the regulatory commissions are not um, giving our commissions people a lot of grief over missing those. And also fines have become a new factor um, from regulatory agencies for failure to meet laws or regulations associated with, with any kind of uh, degree in utilities, and some of that is falls on vegetation, uh, particularly on the transmission side. Uh, the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has uh, established some heavy fines uh, for utilities that have tree-related outages on their transmission system. Well, Right Tree, Right Place program has been something utilities have been promoting for a long period of time, and I've been in the industry 24 years, and, and I actually cut my teeth on doing Right Tree, Right Place programs uh, when I first started uh, with Allegheny Power. And uh, the program is designed to stress putting appropriate sized trees in the available growing space. And obviously, when you have a power line overhead, your available growing space is reduced from a height perspective. And uh, so we want to make sure that we're getting trees in those locations that are, that are height appropriate and also removing those trees in those locations that, that cause problems. In education communi communication, the concept is a challenge. I think, as, as Leland and Greg mentioned, it's, it's really improved over the last 10 to 12 years. 
uh, but there are many groups that are involved in trying to, to get this message across to uh, homeowners, uh, landscape architects, uh, government planners at all levels, and I think that's one of our, our you know, next challenges to make sure we hit the planning community as best as we can. Uh, tree commissions, uh, many tree commissions now understand the concept, and uh, that's improved a lot over the last 10 to 15 years. And then in some communities, you have volunteer groups which are involved with the tree uh, maintenance uh, in the community, and so we need to educate those people as well. Here's a couple of pictures that show you uh, situations where we don't have a right tree in the right place uh, for more mature trees and, and what it means from a power line perspective. Uh, the tree on the left, you notice it's kind of got a notch in the middle of it, and where that notch is, uh, the bottom of that notch is where the, the power line is actually running through the tree. The tree has grown up on either side of the conductors, and uh, but the, where the power line is, because it's energized, it's actually burning off the vegetation at that point, and so the tree cannot is having a difficult time growing past that. Now, what will eventually happen is those two sides are growing up on either side will come together, and we'll have a hole in the middle of that tree. If this continues much longer, there will actually what I would call sort of a donut look, where you have a round hole in the middle where the conductor is, and then the vegetation all the way around. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to have a momentary or a sustained outage, like we talked about before. Uh, it also creates a safety problem if you have if you possibly have children that like to climb trees in that environment. The picture on the right is a little different uh, situation. You actually have two conductors on that cross arm and the pole you see there in the background uh, that are energized. And you can see there's a, a sort of like a, a three-pronged look to the tree in the background there. Uh, the piece in the middle is actually growing up between those energized conductors. Uh, makes it very, very difficult to uh, and very time-consuming and, and creates a safety hazard uh, for the individuals that are maintaining that tree, uh, trying to get that vegetation out from between those, those conductors. Trees can create other issues as well, as we're all familiar with. And the picture on the left shows your typical uh, town sidewalk that's been elevated by the by the tree buttress. And uh, then the picture on the right shows what often is the solution to uh, uh, those types of lifting situations on cement or concrete on sidewalks and driveways in this case. And you can see that there's been a, a couple of new sections of sidewalk that have been poured, as well as the apron to that driveway. And what happens, obviously, in those situations, in order to do that, those slabs are four to five inches thick, uh, then all the tree roots that have to come out through there get severed, and it can create uh, problems with the stability of those trees. If you look at the conditions of some street trees, you'll, you'll see that they're, they're pretty bad. The tree in the upper left, you can see a lot of the bark has been has been come off that tree over the years. The crown looks pretty good. I didn't take include that in the picture. Uh, the picture on the upper right is actually the, the base of that tree, the same tree on the upper left, and you can see that little hole there, and I was able to take my pencil and stick it all the way in there, and if I had let it go, it would have disappeared. And uh, so it's a, it's a tree that's not safe, not necessarily just for power lines, but for the public at large. Uh, the tree in the lower left, sugar maple, um, obviously has some serious conditions, and the tree in the lower right uh, shows the crown of a different sugar maple where once it's been uh, trimmed, you've had some sun scald issue, and you've got quite a bit of decay on those scaffold branches in that tree. Um, I guess the question is, you know, are all trees worth saving? And I, I think that, you know, in our hearts we like to think they are, but in reality uh, we know they're not. And here you have some, some examples of some trees that over the years from repeated trimming um, have, just, have just really degraded to the point that really the best solution is, is removal and replacement with a species which is compatible for those sites. Here's some examples of wrong tree, wrong place that are recently planted. Here's a, a couple of new power lines in our service area. Uh, this is maybe one of those areas where the, the project uh, planners and coordinators did not engage utilities or, or the landscape architect or the city planners uh, said, hey, we need a tree every so many feet. And, of course, there's a power line there, and we end up, it looks like in both cases, uh, with sycamores or plane trees planted directly underneath power lines. And, of course, these trees want to reach 80 or 90 feet in height someday, and you have them located in basically a 35 or 40-foot growing space. And what happens to some street trees? You know, the example we saw a little bit earlier of where the sidewalk had been replaced, if you look at the tree on the left, uh, you might be able to notice that in the foreground there, it looks like the driveway uh, apron is a different color than the sidewalk behind it. 
And uh, so it looks like there's a recent cut there in order to re-pour that driveway, which may have been cracked or lifting. And, uh, in fact, when you look at the where the tree is uprooted, you'll see that very straight edge, and it does look like it was all cut right along that edge. And uh, as a result, that created some instability with that tree. And when a thunderstorm came along, uh, you can see the damage it caused. Similar situation in the picture in the upper right. Um, you see also that we have some new sidewalk behind that particular tree that's uprooted right there, and uh, it's created a problem with the stability of that tree. And the tree on the lower right um, has had some extensive decay in the butt, and uh, it's been allowed to stand rather than be removed. Obviously, there's an emotional attachment to having large trees in city and town environments. Uh, perhaps this is one tree that may have been best to have been removed. So what happens when utilities start trimming uh, street and yard trees? Um, property owners can object to utilities and municipal officials. Uh, traffic is often disrupted uh, because a uh, lane has to be closed in order for that to that activity to be uh, performed. Uh, individual tree trimming is very expensive for utilities, and um, so it's a problem from that perspective. And then I guess the worst thing from my, my viewpoint is that distrust can develop between utility foresters and other tree-related groups instead of working together for the betterment of communities and the tree populations within those communities. Here's some pictures of some after trimming that, that we've performed and, and trying to, you know, take out the middle of the tree around the conductors. And you see this tree in the left-hand side um, is, a, is a very large silver maple. And, uh, you know, the tree's been opened up in the middle in order to allow the, the passage of the conductor through it. Same thing on the right-hand side, uh, another large maple in which the, the tree has been sort of what we call beat out or hewed out uh, in order to give adequate con conductor clearance for the period of time which we will maintain that tree. So what are some utilities doing with Right Tree and Right Place programs? Well, I did a web search on Right Tree, Right Place electricity, and that gave me over 970,000 hits on Google. And many of the top few links took you to utility websites, which contain some pretty good information about tree planting and, and, and spaces around power lines. And I would encourage you to take a look at some of that um, if you have an interest in that. On an individual tree basis, uh, there are voucher programs. We have a voucher program that allows a homeowner to select a tree that's appropriately sized for the given growing space uh, from a nursery in exchange for removal of a tree that might be in their front yard. And this has worked very well for us. Um, it does give us some, some leverage with the property owner to remove a tree. It uh, gives the property owner an opportunity to go down and, and to find a tree that can fit that space and to get a tree back in that location. And uh, municipal-wide tree programs, there are many, um, you know, different formats. Uh, we can, as an individual utility, you can work with community leaders. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And then also we have a sort of unique program in West Virginia, a municipal tree restoration program, which is sort of an offshoot of that program with the same title that started in Pennsylvania. And uh, I'd just like to review that with you because I think it's a, it's a great program that works very well. Here's a, sort of a planting guide that we have used for public education. Such guides are available from different utilities, but it kind of gives property owners a, an idea of, you know, what are sort of height limitations you should be looking for from what particular distances from, from power lines of different types. And uh, if you have not seen such a uh, planting guide, you may contact your local utility, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to provide something very similar to that to you. On individual tree programs, I mentioned before, we have a, a tree voucher program uh, that in return for, for letting us remove a tree. A property owner can go down and, and to the local nursery, and we have different nurseries that we contract with in order to uh, provide this service. And in exchange for that voucher, can can pick up a tree of appropriate size to plant back in that space. And we provide the nurseries with lists of species which we feel are appropriate. And the, the two pictures on the right, the picture on top shows a, a tree, a maple, Silver, I believe, which has got the uh, power line, the uh, pole, and the transformer pretty much engulfed. Uh, it's up into the lines. Uh, same pole um, with that tree removed. That uh, gives us much better sight lines and uh, opportunity. Keeps that tree out of that site, uh, that pole, and those wires, and reduces the opportunity for an outage. And now uh, we gave the property and provide the property owner a voucher, which they can then take down uh, to the local nursery to get a tree to replace that. Uh, Municipal-wide programs can work different ways. A utility can work directly with a local government agency to implement the program. 
and uh, this is what I started out doing when I started working with a power company. Uh, you can meet with an assigned group to explain the program, see if there's any interest. And in the assigned group, what I mean by that is in some communities, uh, you might talk directly to the mayor. Um, you might go and uh, make a presentation to the town council. There may be a tree commission that you work with. And whoever the group is that sort of has responsibility for those programs in the community um, is who, who we try and start with and identify and start with in order to see if there's interest to participate in the program. Uh, we then would do, go out and identify trees for removal and potential planting sites. And in some cases, uh, some of the uh, communities, even though the trees are on uh, public property, would want you to talk to the budding property owners um, in order to make sure they buy into it too and they're not going to be upset if the, the large tree out in front of their property on the street is suddenly gone and being replaced with a smaller tree. Uh, once you have all that in place, you go out and remove the approved trees and get the replacement trees planted. And then we have always provided education for property owners and communities on proper care of young trees. And our program in West Virginia is, is a cooperative program between the, the utilities in West Virginia, which is ourselves, Allegheny Power, um, Appalachian Power, which is part of uh, AEP, or American Electric Power Company, um, and between the West Virginia Division of Forestry Reserve and Community Forestry Program. And we started this in about two, the year 2000. West Virginia, historically, uh, the towns have been poor managers of tree population, have little knowledge about trees. Uh, tree boards in 2000 were scarce, and really the state agencies in West Virginia were looked on with as much or more distrust than utilities, and West Virginia, once again, being a very rural uh, community with a lot of independent-minded people, uh, the state was not, state people were not looked on any better than the utility folk. But the program goals were to reduce tree and utility line conflicts and to open the door for the Division of Forestry to assist towns with their tree populations. And so this is kind of how it works. Each year, the utilities in the state provide the Division of Forestry with a list of towns on their work schedule. Uh, Division of Forestry contacts those towns to explain the program and to gauge interest. If they are interested, the Division of Forestry visits the community to assess the trees, review planting sites, discuss management, identify local groups, et cetera. A uh, local utility forester then reviews the town for potential removals and planting locations. And the Division of Forestry will develop a contract for each community to outline the removals and the number of species of trees to be planted in the planting sites. State then aggregates all the towns into a package and puts it out to the state nurseries for competitive bid. And this is a very important process for us because we are uh, a company that uh, demands that everything that over a certain dollar amount be put out to competitive bid. And once the trees are in the ground, the nursery plants and the invoices are sent to the utilities to pay. There are some challenges to the program. It can be very difficult to identify interested groups and communities to champion this program and that are willing to work with both the state and the utilities. And significant, there are significant knowledge and attitude barriers about how trees should be maintained in many small rural communities. Uh, most of the people there grew up with uh, topping being the preferred practice and there's still a prevalent attitude of that uh, in many towns. And then also, of course, you have a continual turnover of municipal officials, which means every time you come back four or five year cycle, uh, you may mean starting over and trying to identify new people uh, to work with the program. So we have had some successes since the inception. Over 1,500 power line friendly trees have been planted in over 30 communities. Many of these communities never gave a thought to managing their tree populations before. Our participating communities are made aware of the benefits of trees and managing that asset, and they're beginning establishing contact with the state urban foresters. Now, there's been many tree boards have been established where they were never even considered before, and utilities have reduced the tree populations to manage, thus we lower our future costs and potential conflict. And now, actually, in some communities, utility foresters are seen as a source of information, and in fact, in a couple cases, are members of local tree boards. And I just want to show you a couple pictures. Here are some trees that were planted. This is once again in Buchanan, West Virginia. Uh, some trees planted down this strip where there were larger trees uh, beforehand. And even in cases where there may not be existing trees, we like to get uh, appropriate sized uh, species in these spaces that are available to plant underneath power lines, even if there aren't trees there to remove. Uh, here's a picture that's actually in a town of Pennsylvania, Vandergrift. The trees are a little more mature. Uh, you can see the effect of these trees and the clearance we have, the conductors. Obviously, it's a situation where we'll never have to disrupt this community again uh, in order to trim trees in this location. 
And of course, here's the, the happy pictures, you know, the, uh, the, the community, the Arbor Day celebration up in the, in the Tree City, USA presentation in Parkersburg, West Virginia in the upper left. And of course, we all love the little kids shot planting the trees down in the lower right. How to get the program started or how to start any program, please get to know your local utility forester. Realize they have goals which will complement your own. And they do want to work with you to manage trees which can impact their facilities. I just understand they have budgets and need to be able to justify any expenditure. So, you know, some outlandish requests may be refused. Just please understand that. And But utilities, it's important to remember, have a desire to have strong, healthy trees near their facilities. And, of course, I think this is the same desire we have for all trees and towns that we work with. So uh, contact information on the Utility Arbor Association site has some uh, excellent material on this topic, and there's their email address and my, my email address is, I mean, excuse me, their web address and my email address is also attached. So that's it. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chip. That was a fantastic presentation and really comprehensive. Uh, Pat, can we open up the line for questions? Certainly. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchstone phone. Remember to unmute your phone and record your name when prompted. One moment, please. And also, again, folks should feel free to type in their questions over the web uh, by clicking on that Q&A tab at the top of the screen. Yep, I think the, the program that you talked about that you guys uh, do with West Virginia is really fantastic, uh, really good program. And actually, just, I think the APPA reports that there are several hundred tree planting projects by utilities or programs by utilities across the country. So it's uh, something that's happening all over the country, and folks can uh, hopefully take advantage of wherever you're living. Also, uh, there are a number of nonprofit, you know, in addition to government and utility partnerships, there are a lot of nonprofit and utility partnerships, uh, including ones that ACT member groups are doing right now. Canopy out in Palo Alto has a really great one. Uh, so does the New York State Urban Forestry Council with National Grid. Uh, so these are these are models, and we'll we'll write up more about them for folks to learn about in our resource list. But Chip, I wanted to ask you about the the replacement voucher program. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's great in many ways. It's probably also very good for the local nursery business, and that's giving them, uh, you know, good business. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you guys had done uh, some follow up and uh, seen if homeowners generally are, are taking advantage of this good opportunity and are planting new trees. Well, we do we do track the vouchers that have been been redeemed, and they're always you know you always have a percentage that never turn up, and so you wonder you know if you're if you're kind of beating your head on the wall. But um, most of them are redeemed. In fact, every now and then, and probably once or twice a year, we'll get a situation where a voucher that we issued seven or eight years ago, possibly um, you know somebody may have passed away, or they're cleaning out the drawer somewhere, and they come across this voucher, and they'll call us up and ask if it's ask if it's still good because we do put an expiration date on them. Uh, we've always um, honored those and issued them a new voucher in order to go out and get that tree replaced so, um, or get a tree planted. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, Leland. Sometimes, uh, for the most part, I'd say we probably get a 70 to 80 percent return on those. People are getting trees back in the ground. But you always have a certain percentage that, for some reason or another, never follow through. Right. That's true with any program. Uh, I wanted to ask you about those. The pictures of the maples you showed that are uh, U'd out or V'd out, yes, or sir. you want to call them. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, I've seen that, you know, in town and even right here in College Park where, where the Alliance for Community Trees office is. Is that uh, sort of a structurally safe way to go about doing it, and what does it mean for the tree? Well, what we're trying to do is, you know, we're trying to keep as much of the crown of the tree in place as possible to reduce the overall impact of the trimming on the tree, and then also trying to, to eliminate a lot of the scaffold branching where you can get that sun scald. It's a, it's a program that the utility has gone to to try and preserve as much of the tree crown as possible, yet still getting clearance from the vine. Now, there, there could, I could anticipate that if they get enough weight out, if you have, say, for example, a silver maple, which has been Topped repeatedly, you've got a lot of um, decay, which has started in some of those spots out there, but now we're letting vegetation grow out on the end of that. I think that needs to be looked at to make sure that, that over time there's not more weight going out on the end of those limbs and possibly what that, that decay point can handle. But for the most part, we have seen very little negative uh, impact on the health of the tree from trimming in that uh, in that manner. 
Uh, trees do seem to, to like it and look like it as best as they can. And um, it's always barrier, though, visually until you get used to seeing that. Um, but the thing I like about it is that even though if you look down the street and you see this, this V out, and if you take the property and around to their front porch and you look at the tree from their yard and you look up at the crown of the tree, it looks like doesn't even look like the tree has been trimmed and you still have a lot of shade uh, that's been maintained in the yard as well. And I, I like that uh, you're mentioning reaching out to homeowners and, and showing them the importance of the work you're doing and getting them on board, which is something that uh, utilities, private uh, arboriculture companies, state, city governments, and nonprofits are all working to, to do to educate homeowners and practitioners. And that's what we're trying to do with these webcasts. So I want to thank Chip and Greg for both giving their time today uh, for our webcast and for two great presentations. I think we're going to close it up right there. And folks, when, sorry we didn't get to go back to the line for questions. You can email them to me. Uh, but we just want to keep this right to an hour so folks can get on with, with the rest of their afternoon. These presentations uh, and recorded session will be available in about one week, as will a related resource list. Uh, and we will email everyone who completes our brief survey, which I'll put up right here. Uh, we'll email you with those resources. So please take a minute to complete this survey. The next webcast session is the fourth and final in this four-part series is Species Selection Part 4, Life After Planting, on September 2nd, the first day in September. It here helps us to uh, refine our webcast series and uh, make sure that we're covering topics that you want to hear about. So take a second to complete that. We'll also email it out to everybody. I want to say a big thank you to Greg Page and Chip Brown, our presenters today, two excellent presentations. Uh, and to everyone who participated and will listen in, and a big thank you to our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for participating on today's conference call. You may disconnect at this time.